we'll give us some time, inshallah. <laughs> Things like this don't happen every day, so we'll give us some time, inshallah. It wanted to listen to the khutbah too, mashallah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina min yahdihi allahu ta'ala fala mudillalah wa min yudlil fala hadiyalah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyuhu wa rasooluh salawat allahi wa salamuhu alayhi qala allahu tabarak wa ta'ala fi kitabihi al-kareem ba'da an a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun ya ayyuhal nasu attaqu rabbakum al-ladhi khalakakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisaa wa attaqu allaha al-ladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqiba ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha wa qulu qawlan sadi يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد my respected brothers and sisters in Islam during the time of the Prophet wasallam, there used to be a group of companions that used to live in the back of the masjid. And they were known as Ahl al-Suffa. These were people that were from all parts of the, or all parts of the Arabian Peninsula. And they would come to seek knowledge from the Prophet wasallam himself. But they didn't have any financial means and they weren't really stable enough to take care of themselves and they weren't businessmen nor were they any business women from them. So the Prophet wasallam allowed them to sleep in the back of the masjid. They were known as Ahl al-Suffa. And amongst the most popular of them was our famous companion of ours, the narrator of most of a hadith that you'll find, and that is Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, or, or known as Abdurrahman bin Sakhr radiallahu anhu. Anyways, one of the companions of Ahl al-Suffa was extremely hungry, being that he was extremely poor and he didn't have any food to eat, nor did he have a place to stay. He goes to the Prophet ﷺ one day, extremely hungry, looking for something to eat. So he goes up to the Prophet ﷺ and says, Ya Rasulullah, do you have anything to eat? Now the Prophet ﷺ is their provider. So they had every right to ask the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ decides to go to his family and ask them if they have any food. So he goes to his wives and he says, do you have any food? And they say, all we have is water, Ya Rasulullah. He goes to his next wife, he says, do we have any food? He says, all we have is water. He keeps on going to his other family, his other family. All we have is water, all we have is water, all we have is water. Now, I, I want to stop in this story and, and show you something about the Prophet wasallam. Is that how the greatest man that ever walked the face of this planet would go days by and he wouldn't have any food to eat. You know, the scholars say that if rats entered the house of the Prophet wasallam, they would have starved. You can imagine, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha says in authentic hadith in Bulugh al-Maram, she says that months would go by and the companions would not see smoke emerging from the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Because at that time, they, they made you know, food from fire. So it shows them that they had a proper meal if fire was coming out of their houses from their chimneys or what have you. The Prophet ﷺ, months would go by and there would be no smoke. Meaning he didn't have anything to eat. He was known to have aswadan, dates and water. And that's it. Anyhow, the story goes as follows. So the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have anything to eat. He's going to resort into his companions. So he goes to the masjid and he asks his companions that were present. And he says to them, he says, Oh companions, is there any one of you that wants to host my guest? So the companions are looking around left and right. Keep in mind, dear brothers and sisters, that those companions that were present, they were also poor. So they didn't have any money. Because those that were working, the businessmen, 
They weren't in the masjid at that current time because they were busy working. So the Prophet ﷺ asks again, he says, is there anyone here that wants to host my guest? Not your guest, but my guest. Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ asked you to host his guest. No imam, no sheikh, no doctor, no professor. It's the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So no one answered the question. So one of the companions, he feels embarrassed for the Prophet You know, the Prophet is insisting. He keeps asking the companions. So this companion was embarrassed. So he wasn't sure if he had food or not at home. But nonetheless, he raised his hand. I will, Ya Rasulullah. Keep in mind, he didn't know what he had at home either. So the Prophet gives him the guest. And they start to walk to his home. Now when they walk to his home, the companion, he goes to his family first. And he goes to his wife and he says, Do we have any food to eat? And the wife says, We only have enough for our children. We don't even have enough for ourselves. Now keep in mind, when there's food for children, most children, the portion is very small. Maybe not in this day and age. But during the time of the Prophet wasallam, the children, you can, you can understand from this story here that this family was poor. That they only had enough food for their children, not even from, for themselves. So the wife says to, the, to her husband, we only have enough food for our children. So the companion says to his wife, he says, okay, I have an idea. When we go to eat, let us turn off the lights, turn off the lanterns while we eat in the dark. And she's wondering, you know, scratching her head, why? But the, the kids, how are they going to eat? And then he says to her, he says, keep telling the kids that eventually they're going to eat. Keep telling them, don't worry, you're going to eat. Don't worry, you're going to eat. Some scholars actually said that during this incident, they began to boil rocks as it were, you know, sounds of cooking. So the kids can think something is cooking, but by the time you know, it gets late, they, they fall asleep. So, they, the wife did this. Now the man goes and he takes the food from the children. And he turns off all the lights. And he gives it to the guest. Now while the lights are being off, the guest can't really see what's going on. And he says to his wife, he says, pretend that we're eating. So make sounds. You know, mess with the plate a little bit. Make sounds that we're eating, like we're having a good time. So the guest will not feel bad. So alhamdulillah, imagine you having a guest, let alone an extremely hungry guest. And let alone a guest of the Prophet You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to go to him and say to him, you know, I only have food enough for my children. I'm sorry, you got to go. It's already of embarrassment that the Prophet was asking several times to his companions. Now you have raised your hand and you don't have food as well. And it's an embarrassment that you have to return that guest to the Prophet ﷺ and tell him, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have any food either. So he didn't want to do that. So he gave him the food. He deprived his own children from food. He deprived his own spouse and himself from food for the guest of the Prophet ﷺ. The next day, the Prophet ﷺ sees the companion. He sees the wife. And he sees the guests from Ahlul Sufa. And the Prophet says to them, he says, لَقَدْ عَجِبَ أَهْلُ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ فِعْلِكُمَا He says to the companion and the wife, he says, لَقَدْ عَجِبَ أَهْلُ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ فِعْلِكُمَا He says, Allah is amazed at what you two just did. Now the man is wondering, he's scratching his head, he's wondering, what did I do? I mean, the only people that were there were my wife and the guest. Who would tell the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Obviously, it was his Lord Jalla Jalalu, subhanahu wa taala. And because of this incident, Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed one of the most powerful ayat when it comes to unity. And Allah subhanahu wa taala reveals this ayah in chapter Surah Al Hasha, verse number nine. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Wa yuthirun ala anfusihim." وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ وَمَنْ يُلْقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, These Ansar, 
these individuals that came from or that you migrated to Medina, when you left Mecca, you came to them, they welcomed you with open arms. They accepted you for who you were. Even though they had problems and conflict with one another, Aws and Khazraj, the two sub-tribes of Ansar. But when you came, O Muhajirin, from Mecca, they accepted you and welcomed you with open arms. And they preferred others, they preferred others over their own selves, even if it was to harm them. Even if that companion was to go hungry, his wife was to go hungry, his children was to go hungry, they preferred others over themselves. And whosoever is staying away from being stingy of the soul, indeed he is truly successful. Now dear brothers and sisters in this day and age, we live in a very selfish society. Everything is about me, me, me. What do I get out of it? When we look at relationships, when we look at the husband and the wife, the husband says, what do I get out of this relationship? What has she done for me? And the wife says the same. What has my husband done for me? The children have done the same. What has my mom and dad do for me? It's always about myself, myself, myself. When Islam promotes and praises selflessness, it promotes a selfless attitude, altruism. It promotes this attitude to think about others more than you think about yourself. Benefit others more than you benefit yourself. Because dear brothers and sisters, success as an ummah, we should be concerned as succeeding as an ummah rather than individuals. If we continue thinking about succeeding as individuals, just my focus on myself, I don't care about the person next to me, then what happens when your children get older? They need friends. And that friend is going to be the son of the person next to you. And how would that be if you only took care of yourself? You know, there's a famous proverb and it says it takes a village to raise a child. If we only care about ourselves and our families, well, guess what? When your son goes to your uncle's house, things are going to be different. It's not your rules anymore. This is why the Prophet ﷺ gives us a beautiful parable of the ummah. And the Prophet ﷺ says, this ummah is like a boat with two decks. The top deck, everyone is relaxed and every, everyone has everything on the top deck. As for the bottom deck, they don't have much. They don't have anything. So the bottom deck says, you know what? Since we don't have anything, since they're not giving us anything, why don't we just create holes in the boat? We'll have water. So they start to poke the holes. And lo and behold, they have water. But what happens to the boat? It begins to sink. So we, as they say, we are only as strong as our weakest link. If we don't take care of the brother next to us and his needs, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not take care of our needs. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, he says, Man satara Allahu, man satara abdan. He says, whosoever covers a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, satara Allahu fi dunya wal akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover him in the dunya and the akhirah. Does it mean, you know, covering with cloth or covering with a, a blanket or a sheet or what have you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is saying covering his faults. If you see your Muslim brother or sister doing something wrong, if you heard of your Muslim brother or sister doing something wrong, the first thing that you should do is not spread the news. The first thing that you should do is not publicize that news. Spread it on Facebook. Spread it on social media. Let it spread like a wildfire. Unfortunately, this is the society that we live in. That once we reach news, we want to tell it to everybody. Trivial matters. Small issues. Bad things. A bad reputation for your brother or your sister. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whosoever covers his Muslim brother or sister, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover him in the dunya and in the akhirah. Imagine on the day of judgment you're standing and you don't see any of your bad deeds. Because Allah has covered all of them. Because you have covered your Muslim brother and sister when they have committed a bad deed. When you didn't want to expose them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has covered them. Because you weren't selfish. You didn't care about yourself. You see, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they have this famous term, and it's radiallahu anhum maradu'an. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is very easy for us to be pleased with Allah being our maker, being our creator, being our Lord Jalla Jalalu. But we are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we seek that pleasure? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرُ حَتَّى تُنْفِكُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ you will not reach the epitome of piety. You will not reach true piety until you give from what you love. It is very easy, brothers and sisters, to give canned goods, hand-me-downs, clothes you don't wear anymore, shoes you don't wear anymore. Very easy. But it's very difficult to give something that means dear, you know, dearest to you. That you have value to yourself, it is very difficult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those individuals that are selfless, that don't care about themselves, themselves, themselves. Such as the story of Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, radiallahu anhu, the son of the worst enemy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can you believe that? The worst son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the worst enemy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his son became Muslim. Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, radiallahu anhu. During the Battle of Yarmouk, when the Muslims fought the Roman Empire, Ikrimah was injured and he was crying out for water. And when he's about to drink the water, the soldiers come and they give him the water. When he's about to drink the water, he sees an, 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 another individual next to him that he's also wounded and needs water. So Ikrimah says, he needs water more than I do. Give it to him. So they gave, him, they gave the water to him. The second individual, he takes the water and he's about to drink it and he sees a third individual. And he says, that person, he, he looks like he needs it. And you know, the third individual is crying out for water. So he says, give it to the third individual. He might need it more than I do. So they go to the third, they rush to the third person. Lo and behold, by the time they reach that third person, he ha already has passed. He's dead. They go back to Ikrima. Ikrima was the first. He needed water. He's our general. They go back to Ikrima. Radiallahu anhu, he's passed. They go to the second guy, he is passed. Such is the example of being selfless. They've sacrificed their lives for wa yu'thiruna ala anfusihim walaw kana bihim khasasa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored this companion and revealed an ayah after him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those that are selfless. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rid us of the evil trait of selfishness. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم sets a condition and he says والله في عون العبد ما كان العبد في عون أخيه. The Prophet ﷺ gives us a condition. He says, if you want the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your lives, you have to be in the assistance of your fellow Muslim brother or sister. This is a condition. If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, you have to help your brother. You have to help your sister. If you're only caring about yourself, myself and my family, where I'm going to be, everything is about me, then we will not succeed as an ummah. There's a famous story or a famous companion by the name of Jarir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu. And I wanted to share you this story because I want to show you the harsh reality of the society that we live in of being selfish. And most of us, when we hear this story, we're going to see nothing wrong with it. Because society has taught us that being selfish is okay. When Islam is promoting the opposite. Jirir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, as all of us as Muslims and the companions radiallahu anhum, we pledged allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we said, Ashhadu anna Muhammad al Rasulullah, I bear witness and testify that Muhammad is the last and final messenger of, the Prophet, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have pledged allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu wa ta'ah. We hear and we obey, Ya Rasulullah. So Jirir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, one day, he happens to pass by the marketplace and he sees this old farmer 
that is trying to just make ends meet. He's selling his horse. And he's selling his horse and he says, anyone want to buy my horse? Anyone wants to buy my horse? So Jareer bin Abdullah, he sees this horse and it's a little bit beat. The horse is not in good condition. And Jareer bin Abdullah says, how much are you selling it for? And the man says, you know, the normal price for horses, 400 dirham. 400 dirham. So Jareer bin Abdullah, he says, you know, the horse, he starts to look at it. And he says, you know, the horse deserves more than this. 400? I'll give you 500. So the man says, uh, 550. He starts to raise the price on Jareed bin Abdullah. Jareed says, radiallahu anhu, he says, keep going. It deserves more than that. So the farmer looks and he says, 600. He says, keep going. Until they reach 800 dirham. He says, here you go. He gives him the dirham, 800 dirham. And he takes the horse. Now when he takes the horse home, just like how in this day and age we take a new car home, obviously the family and the friends are going to ask you, MashaAllah, where would you get your new car? MashaAllah, how much did you get it for? So likewise, Jareer bin Abdullah, radiallahu anhu, his friends, when they saw him with a new horse, they said, MashaAllah, where would you get the new horse, Jareer? Oh, I bought it from the farmer in the marketplace. How much did you get it for? Oh, I got it for 800 dirham. So they looked at each other, 800 dirham? 800 dirham? And they said to Jareer bin Abdullah, they said, I could have bought two horses with that price. You got ripped off, as we say in this day and age. Jareer bin Abdullah, they asked him, they said, why did you, you know, buy it for so much? And he laughed at them. And he said, when I pledged allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has taught us to benefit others before benefiting myself. When we benefit others is a priority now. Benefiting myself is secondary. When I saw that farmer was in dire need of money, I gave it to him. Because at the end of the day, I will make money. But he won't. And he was just trying to make ends meet. Therefore, he had to sell his horse. If we make things relevant to this day and age, most of us here are immigrants. And when we go back home to our countries, we see these individuals on the street selling things. You know, as, you know, in Saudi Arabia they say five rials, two rials, one rial. They'll shout it out, whatever currency it may be. And we tend to haggle with these individuals. Because we are selfish. We're thinking we want to get a deal from this. And this person's trying to rip us off. But did we ever consider, did we ever think that possible, a chance, that this individual that's in front of you doesn't even make a fraction of what you make back home in America. Doesn't go back home to a warm home and a beautiful car and a beautiful house just like you. Do we ever consider that? Or is it because of this selfish attitude that we are taught that it's always about me, me, me? You see, I conclude, dear brothers and sisters, with the very famous hadith. Very famous hadith, most of us know this hadith, most of us take this hadith, we take advantage of this hadith when we want service to ourselves, and that is, none of you shall be a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. You'll hear this many times when it comes to Muslims. You know, Sufyan, you have five dollars? No, I don't have any five dollars. None of you shall be a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. When it comes to materialistic things, you'll hear this hadith. But where is this hadith implemented? When it comes to insults, when it comes to backbiting, when it comes to spreading rumors, we wouldn't want that for ourselves. We wouldn't want anyone to backbite us. We wouldn't want anyone to hate us. We wouldn't want anyone to insult us. So why do we do the same to others? This is a staple of, you know, this hadith is actually the lowest standard of unity. The highest is what we mentioned earlier, al itha preferring others over yourselves. That is the highest. Yet the lowest is none of you can truly be believers until you love for your brother what you love for yourself.
If you love happiness, O oh Muslim brother or sister, then love it for others. If you love that no one speaks ill of you, then don't speak ill of others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us attain this beautiful trait of al ithar selflessness. And we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rid us of this selfish attitude and to join us in the company of the companions that preferred others over themselves. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.